Why was the color green notoriously single? It was always so jaded. Today, I'm going to recap a 2011 action fantasy film called Captain America, The First Avenger. A quick warning, there will be major spoilers ahead. Tonsberg, Norway, 1942. Two caretakers for an ancient Viking ruin listen, as their town is overrun by Nazis. A dark figure appears in the exploded entryway. Johann Schmidt, a high-ranking Nazi and leader of the Hydra sect, nonchalantly enters. He crosses the room, comes to the difficult-to-open sarcophagus, and easily pushes the lid free. Within he finds the skeletal remains of an old Viking clutching a glass cube, the Tesseract. He smashes it on the floor and goes to the caretaker, asking where the real cube is hidden. Schmidt pries the drawer open and finds the real, glowing cube concealed within. Schmidt orders his men to shell the city and then shoots the luckless caretaker. At a recruiting station in Brooklyn, Steve Rogers, 90 pounds, 5 foot tall, asthmatic, eagerly awaits the opportunity to enlist in the United States Army. The Army doctor gives a once-over to Steve's medical file, which reads like that of a 90-year-old man, and rejects Steve's application, as this is his fourth failed attempt to enlist. Distraught, Steve heads to the movies. He envies the enlisted men featured in the pre-show newsreel, and watches as other audience members tear up. A loud-mouthed, impatient moviegoer begins yelling at the screen, start the movie, I didn't pay to see this crap. Steve tells the man to shut up, and as the man turns around, stands up and towers above him. In the alley, the bully savagely beats the scrawny Steve, who bravely fights back, but is easily overpowered. Steve's best friend, James Bucky Barnes, swiftly kicks the bully away and tends to Steve. Bucky is now an enlisted man. His application was accepted, and he's been assigned to the 107th Infantry. In a celebratory mood, Bucky invites Steve to go dancing with a pair of girls on a double date. Bashfully, Steve tags along. The four head to the World's Fair in Queens and watches, as Playboy inventor Howard Stark unsuccessfully demonstrates a flying car. Steve breaks away from the group and goes to another recruiting station. Bucky catches up with him and asks how Steve intends to forge his application this time. Unbeknownst to them both, Dr. Abraham Erskine, while passing by, eavesdrops on their conversation. He is fascinated by the gumption of Steve. Bucky wishes Steve good luck on his latest application, and Steve heads into the recruiting station for his fifth physical. Inside, Steve sits on an examination table and grows nervous when an MP enters the room and is soon followed by Dr. Erskine. Dr. Erskine has all of Steve's prior applications on file. Erskine tests his character by asking if his insistence on applying for military service is driven purely by a desire to kill Nazis. Steve sincerely reveals that he is not a killer at heart, but does not like bullies, regardless of their origin. Won over by Steve's strong will and unwavering conviction, Erskine accepts his latest application. In a secret military installation high in the Alps, Johann Schmidt brings the glowing cube to Dr. Arnim Zola, his hydro weapon specialist. The cube's seemingly limitless power enables Schmidt and Dr. Zola to power unstoppable energy guns and cannons. Meanwhile, Steve has been enlisted into basic training under the careful watch of Dr. Erskine and Colonel Chester Phillips. He and his platoon are told that they are candidates for the government's latest super soldier program. Phillips is unimpressed with Steve and is vexed by Dr. Erskine's interest in him. During basic training, Steve meets a beautiful but driven British officer, Peggy Carter, who seems to pity him. Despite being the smallest and weakest of the platoon, Steve demonstrates the greatest spirit, selflessness, and ingenuity, especially when his platoon are charged with retrieving a flag from the top of a tall pole as the other, more fit men in the company fail the task one by one as they try to climb up the pole, Steve casually pulls the pin holding it up, taking the flag when the pole crashes to the ground. Phillips, still unconvinced, tosses a grenade into the group during calisthenics, and they all scatter. Phillips is surprised when Steve alone leaps on top of it, willing to sacrifice himself to save the others, before discovering that the grenade was a dummy. Phillips concedes to Erskine's decision. That evening, Dr. Erskine speaks with Steve. 
The two bond over a bottle of schnapps, and Dr. Erskine reveals that this is not his first time performing this experiment. He was ordered by Johann Schmidt to create a serum that would give a man godlike strength. Dr. Erskine created an early version of the serum he intends to use on Steve. Only when Schmidt injected himself, his body's skin corroded away. Undeterred by the risk, Steve agrees to follow through with the procedure. The following morning, Steve and Peggy enter the antique shop and descend into a secret military bunker concealed within. Peggy leads Steve to the heart of the bunker, where they find Dr. Erskine preparing a medical capsule along with Howard Stark and Colonel Phillips rubbing elbows with senators and dignitaries. Steve is told to remove his shirt and sit in the capsule. Erskine's serum is injected into Steve's muscles, and Steve is enclosed within the Vita Ray capsule. The capsule glows brightly, and the procedure is quickly completed. When the capsule is shut down, Steve comes out a foot taller and a hundred pounds heavier with solid muscle, which is just the most superficial aspects of his body, artificially raised to the maximum human potential. Everybody, including Phillips, celebrates the success of the procedure and descends from the viewing chamber to congratulate Erskine. A lone dignitary, in actuality a German spy named Heinz Kruger, stays behind, placing a small satchel on a chair. Moments later, the viewing gallery explodes. Kruger descends the stairs and fatally shoots Dr. Erskine twice. He swiftly kills the guards and flees onto the streets with Peggy in hot pursuit. Steve tends to a dying Dr. Erskine, who has just enough energy to point to Steve's heart before he dies. Steve bolts out of the bunker in pursuit of Kruger. In the street, Peggy pursues Kruger and easily kills his getaway driver. Kruger steals a taxi and aims to run over Peggy. Steve arrives in the nick of time, saving her from being killed by the oncoming taxi. Steve pursues the taxi on foot, running faster than a normal human can and not suffering the fatigue even at the roof of the taxi. Kruger flees to his Hydra sub, which dives underwater just as Steve arrives. Steve dives after the sub, punches a hole through the cockpit's glass, and yanks Kruger to the surface. Kruger then kills himself with a cyanide capsule, letting out one last, Heil Hydra before dying. Meanwhile, Schmidt and Dr. Zola are visited by a trio of Hitler's top commanders, tasked with inspecting Schmidt's operation. They ridicule Schmidt, saying that the Nazi party no longer takes him in Hydra seriously due to his obsession with magic and the occult, and playfully refer to him as the Red Skull, a name that infuriates Schmidt. Schmidt takes the three to his weapons lab, where they are shown his unstoppable energy weapons. Schmidt quickly vaporizes the three Nazi officers. Schmidt announces that Hydra has disbanded from the Nazi party and is now enemies with the world. The following day, Phillips and Carter pick up the remains of Dr. Erskine's lab. Steve is eager to go the front lines of the European theater, but Phillips would rather he be a lab rat than a soldier in his army. Steve is approached by a senator holding a newspaper of the prior day's events, emblazoned with a front-page photo of Steve chasing down Heinz Kruger. The senator has an idea that will be mutually beneficial. Steve is enlisted in the USO, United Service Organizations, he takes on the name Captain America, and the show includes a theme song written specifically for him, features dancing girls, and becomes an overnight success, spawning comic books and black and white movies. Steve is soon taken overseas to Italy, where he is to continue entertaining the troops. War-torn men tease him and tell him to get lost. He is soon met by Carter, who along with Phillips, is overseeing European theater of the war. She tells him that the men are unhappy because many men from their division, the 107th Infantry, have been killed in battle. Steve realizes that this is Bucky's division and quickly runs to see Phillips. Phillips is unable to find Bucky's name on his casualty list and tells Steve to go back to his job as a movie star and a cheerleader. Steve aims to steal a jeep, but Carter has a better idea. Howard Stark flies them both over the battlefield in his private plane. Just as anti-aircraft guns from Hydra begin firing on Stark's plane, Steve parachutes in, while the other two escape back to safety. Steve stealthily makes his way into the Hydra base, taking out numerous guards in the process. Inside, Schmidt and Zola are manufacturing enough weapons to wipe out every capital in the world. 
Steve makes his way to the holding cells where he sees hundreds of imprisoned men from the 107. He frees the men and the prisoners manage to overpower their captors, steal guns and tanks, and escape from the facility, destroying much of it. Schmidt watches Steve by CCTV and quickly realizes that he must be Erskine's man. He quickly activates several explosive charges that will level the base. Steve makes his way through the facility and happens across Bucky, and also notices an oversized tactical map mounted on the wall with various marked installations. Steve frees Bucky, who is surprised to see that Steve is taller than him. The two head up the catwalks and find themselves face to face with Schmidt on a retractable bridge. Rogers punches Schmidt, who surprisingly stands his ground. Schmidt plays with his face, which has apparently come free from his skull, and quickly peels it away as a mask. The Red Skull stares back at Rogers and Bucky, and swiftly enters an elevator and escapes. Back at the 107th base camp, Phillips dictates a letter to his typist, telling how Rogers disappeared the prior night and likely perished during the battle. At that, Phillips berates Agent Carter for causing this loss and notes that unlike the indispensable Stark, she herself can be punished. Just then, Rogers arrives with nearly 400 survivors of the 107, carrying samples of the Red Skull's technology, including some combat vehicles, leaving the base in a fervor. Rogers submits himself to Phillips for disciplinary action for going out in direct violation of orders, but is forgiven. At this success, Bucky calls for cheers for Rogers, who has truly become Captain America. Steve gives Phillips and Carter his best recollection of the Hydra base map and tells them that he intends to go to those bases and destroy them one by one and wishes to recruit a team of men made up of those he liberated in Italy. Steve meets the Howling Commandos in a bar and they eagerly accept the offer. While there all the men are surprised as Peggy enters dressed in a form-fitting cocktail dress. She ignores all the men including Bucky and flirts with Steve, telling him that she'd love to have a dance with him someday. The next day, Steve is summoned to the Brooklyn bunker to see Phillips and Stark. Steve is approached by a beautiful female officer who wishes to thank him for his service the best way she knows how. Peggy walks in on Steve, kissing the enlisted woman and angrily storms away. Stark remarks that Rogers has become attached to the triangular shield, which Steve says is a handy tool in the field. Steve finds a plain, circular shield on a lower shelf. Stark explains that the shield is made of a metal called vibranium, which is lighter than steel and is vibration-resistant and will absorb heavy impacts. He holds the shield in front of him and asks Peggy for his opinion. She scornfully fires a clip from a forty-five pistol at the shield. The shield passes the improvised test admirably. As she walks off, Steve passes a sketch of a uniform to Stark. Steve dresses in red, white, and blue fatigues, dons a blue form-fitting helmet, and stows the newly colored shield onto his back. Captain America and his soldiers, including Bucky, make their way across Europe, flatting Hydra's bases one by one, with Rogers becoming quite skilled at using the shield as a projectile weapon and also discovering that it can ricochet off several surfaces and not lose any velocity. News of his exploits reach the Red Skull and Zola. The Skull is furious and murders the last man alive at one of his destroyed facilities. High in the Alps, Steve and three members of the team zip line across a massive chasm and storm the train car by car. Soon, Cap and Bucky are cornered by heavily armed Hydra soldiers. They narrowly defeat the soldiers, However, Bucky is tossed from the train and plummets into an icy river below. Zola is apprehended. Rogers and his team prepare a battle plan to take down Red Skull at his headquarters. Rogers, dressed in a new uniform, mounts a Harley and charges the base. He easily dodges Hydra soldiers and tanks and finds himself within the base, surrounded by a Hydra army. He is taken into custody and lent to the Red Skull's private weapons lab. Red Skull asks what makes Steve so special. Steve says, nothing, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn, moments before members of his team zipline into Red Skull's office. A climatic firefight ensues as hundreds of soldiers under the direction of Phillips and Carter storm the base, killing many Hydra soldiers. Red Skull flees to his private hangar, in which a gigantic flying wing, powered by the Tesseract, is preparing for takeoff. 
Phillips and Carter arrive in the Skull's Roadster, and the three take off after the plane. Just as Steve is about to leap onto the plane, Peggy stops him and kisses him. Steve leaps from the Roadster onto one of the plane's massive wheels. He sneaks into the craft where he finds dozens of missile planes. Hydra soldiers soon enter the room and Steve battles them, taking out numerous men and tiny planes. Inside the large cockpit, Captain America and Red Skull have a fisticuffs battle. Red Skull fires his cube energy pistol at Steve who easily deflects the shots using his shield. A shot is deflected into one of the cockpit's center consoles. The console is damaged and Skull lifts the cube into the air. Suddenly a portal opens above him, showing starry space. The Red Skull glows brightly and is seemingly disintegrated. His remains are swept up into the cosmos. The cube drops to the ground and burns its way down through the plane's hull before plummeting into the ocean below. Steve mans the plane's controls and radios Carter. He tells her that their dance will have to wait. He pushes the plane into a dive and crashes it into a glacier below. Peggy can only hear static. Steve awakens in a 1940s hospital. He gets up, looks out the windows and watches as the hospital door opens. A young nurse who bears a striking resemblance to Peggy enters. Steve looks her over suspiciously. He asks why the radio is playing a game from May 1941, specifically, a game that he knows he attended. She reaches into her pocket and withdraws a two-way radio. Two tall soldiers in black uniforms enter the room, and Steve easily tosses them through a wall. Steve steps through the hole and is surprised to see that the hospital is in fact a movie set. He flees the building and finds himself in Times Square, circa 2011. He peers around, shocked by his surroundings and watches as numerous matching black SUVs encircle him. Nick Fury appears and carefully speaks to Steve. He tells him that he's been asleep in ice for 70 years, in a state of suspended animation. Still perplexed, Steve breathes heavily and sadly tells Fury that he had a date. In a post credit scene, Steve is in an old-fashioned gym. Fury enters the gym and asks Steve if he's had trouble sleeping. Steve cynically asks if Fury has come with another mission. Fury replies in the affirmative. If you enjoyed this video, don't be shy hit the like button, and if you disliked it hit the dislike button twice, just to be sure. You should watch the full movie. Thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe for more video like this.